pure sadness, you guys. My iPhone overheated and shut off, which has never in the life of me having an iPhone ever happened. I am so distraught because the live that I was recording with Ashley is now gone. And I'm really, really sorry about that, but we are going to just kind of try and continue what we had going on. So I'm gonna invite Ashley back right now. Oh, come on. Hello? Oh, hey. So I was telling the folks that apparently my phone overheated, which has never happened in the life of me having the cell phone. And I'm so stinking bummed because we lost all that great content, but hopefully we can hang out a little bit longer and um, ah, such a bummer. Oh, that sucks. Okay. So for anyone who is coming back or um, is just joining for the first time, I am hanging out with Ashley tonight for an Ask Me Anything. Um, we asked some, you guys asked some really, really good questions kind of leading up to this. Um, and we were on the question of um, books that you like to have around. So you had started talking about Big Magic. If you could, Ashley, just kind of continue that thought. You can't hear me? Oh, gosh, I can't hear you either. Ugh, sadness. Can you guys hear me or <laughs> anyone? Oh, man. Let me see. Is my volume? My volume's all the way up. Can anyone hear us? Okay, it looks like they can hear me, but we can't hear you, Ashley. So I'm gonna, okay. Uh, Ashley, try and say something again. <gasps> there you are, okay. <laughs> okay. Yes, yes, I can. Can you hear me now? Okay, good, 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 good. Okay, sorry. So what I was saying is... Oh, Lord. Now, right? so, now we're back. Um, so I was saying that my phone overheated. I can't hear anything. Nothing. Okay, so my phone overheated, which has never happened before. And unfortunately, I lost all that beautiful content that we just created. So we are just going to jump back into this thing. I've, I've moved out of my hot studio and I'm down in my living room. So fingers crossed we won't have this issue again. But... You were on the topic of talking about um, the big magic book. If you could, I just want you to finish that thought and kind of tell us again what the okay. book is about and kind of what it meant to you. It is about living life creatively. Um, and it's basically just about interacting with your creativity and how to navigate living a creative life to the best of your ability. And it's kind of vague. She talks about it. Obviously, she's a writer. She wrote the book. So she talks about creativity in terms of being an author and writing a lot but she also references a lot of other types of creativity and artistry um and it's just it's super relevant for anyone who likes to do anything artistic at all um and it just it's very inspiring it's one of those books where i can only read like 10 pages at a time and then i have to put it yeah. down and think about it because there's just it's so dense and it's so inspirational that it just speaks right to my soul and i think anyone is artistic oh, at all. Should definitely okay, I, I wrote that down upstairs when you first mentioned it and I'm totally getting it. I'm in a I'm in an audio book phase right yeah. now because like I have zero time to mm -hmm. read regular books. Um so I'm gonna see if they have that uh on audiobook. I'm definitely gonna check that out. Awesome. So um for everyone I, coming yeah. in of course um uh, Ashley is hanging out with me tonight on live and this is an ask me anything. Um so go ahead and throw out any questions that you guys have about designing, social media, um, being a full-time maker, anything, any kind of questions that you guys have for either of us, we are happy to answer those. Um, so let me think. Another question that I had for you, Ashley, what is your favorite part about being a full-time maker? I had to think about this one a lot. Tony sent me a couple of questions yesterday, um, and I've tried to think about them. Most of them I knew my answer to, but this one kind of stumped me. Um, Overall, I'd have to say being home with Parker, my two-year-old, every day. Um, I, when I was pregnant with him, I didn't have a successful online business. I didn't have a business of any sort. So it was really going to be kind of interesting what happened when he came into the world. And I knew that I was going to try to be the best mom I could be, but I didn't know I was going to be around all day, every day. That was really kind of going to be figured out as he grew up. And... At this time, I feel really, really lucky that I get to watch him grow and watch him learn every 
new word and try every new food and I get to be there for everything um, while also getting to fulfill my own creative and business uh, endeavors. And it's just, I, it's such a privilege. And I wake up every morning knowing what a privilege it is. And I just, to feel that way and to feel like I have something special and I get to share it with my family is just, oh. it's unreal. I and know, right? I cry, it's happening. I'm the feeling... next one. <laughs> Oh my goodness. That's beautiful. That's, I think that's really, really wonderful. And I think that sentiment is probably shared by a lot of the, the bloggers and designers that we know as well. Um, it's really, it's a treat. And certainly even myself, I don't have children, but I worked full time for many, many years before I finally bit the bullet and quit my day job. And um, it's never lost on me how blessed I am to be able to do this every day. So it is definitely, it's definitely a privilege. Um, so we got a question from Fox in the Moon. She said, how much time do you usually spend designing a pattern? How mm -hmm. long do I spend designing it? Um, it depends on the pattern. If it's a baby hat, it's not going to take me nearly as long. But if it's, let's say, like, I've been very into garment design this year. That's pretty much everything I've done. Um, and it's definitely something that I'm having a lot of fun with. So for one of my garments, I would say it takes a solid 10 days to two weeks of work to design. Um, and that includes time to actually write up the pattern in its formal way and film it and edit it and all of that. But I also only work mm -hmm. on one project at a time. So that's, you asked me earlier, which now I guess it's deleted, um, how I get so much done. And I am not, I can multitask, but I don't because I find I get, things done a lot more slowly, I get more distracted. And when I sit down to work, if I only have an hour mm -hmm. during nap time to get some work done, I sit down and I don't know where to start because I have 10 things that are all sure. partway done. So sure. I always do one thing at a time and I see one design all the way through to the end and it is on the blog ready to be published or it's to the testers or whatever before I start something else. So that is kind of my baby design process a little look into one of the things that I try to do to keep myself sane and to be productive um so yeah it's it's about two weeks I'd say give or take depending on how intricate that's a really great design system is. to have though I mean considering all the things that you have on your plate being able to work on one thing at a time probably the most efficient way that you can work just to make sure you get everything done um because I'm sure we've all probably read mm -hmm. the studies about multitasking because you can't devote 100 percent of your attention to multiple things so that's awesome. Okay, very cool. Right. Next question. Um, this is from KES2987. Um, she says, in your experience, is it more profitable to design or sell items? I have a lot of feelings <laughs> about this question. Um, design. And I will say that because there's a thing called passive income. And this is exactly what I learned from that podcast I mentioned, Creative Yarn Entrepreneur Show. She talks a lot about creative passive income, creating passive income and kind of compounding on your passive income stream. So for anyone that doesn't do this all day every day, um, passive income is when you set something up, you design a pattern, let's say, you put it on the internet and it can sit there until the end of time and it will continue earning page views, it will continue selling on Etsy over and over until the end of time without you doing additional work, except for minimal, like, you know, thing. but you're not redesigning every week to sell it again. Whereas when you make things to sell, you're going to make mm -hmm. one hat, you're going to sell it for however much you are going to sell it for. And then you have to start that process over in order to make more money. But with passive income, you do the one project and it might take you longer but then you're going to make money over and over and over again on that work instead of starting oh, over gosh, every that time. That speaks to my soul. That resonates with me so deeply because I was a um, finished yeah. product seller when I first started my business back in 2013. And I did that for a really, really long time. I didn't design and post my first pattern until 2015. So for two full years, I was trying to sell products. And talk about a rat wow. race. Like I was constantly exhausted and the the even just the whole process of testing what will even sell when you do handmade is like 
I like it's just yeah. it's it's a it ended up feeling like um a poor use of my time and um just the idea of mm -hmm. passive income uh was part of the catalyst for my design process as well um and I'm I'm definitely I we are on the same wavelength <laughs> with that one for sure definitely um so the sage crafter says what are your most and least favorite yarns to work with personally she says like a specific yarn or a so like type of your fiber? Favorite, what's your favorite yarn that's out right now? Mm. Um, I, that's, that's so really overwhelming to answer. It's like, trying, it's, it's well, so let's say, overwhelming. Uh, what's your favorite um, fiber to work with then? We'll start with that. Superwash mm. Merino. Yum be so and I'm gonna say my own yarn because <laughs> I got to design it from the very I picked what the fiber base would be I picked what dye technique to use you know I I literally designed it to my personal liking and specification so I mean it doesn't get better than that that's kind of super why I did it so I'm gonna say I, I'm definitely on board with that because I think there's there's just so much opportunity with superwash merino like it's it can almost feel like a very luxurious workhorse yarn, right? Because you can use it for just about anything. You can get it in a million zillion different colors. And in all honesty, it just always looks good. <laughs> and it feels amazing. So many, like, so many yeah. great benefits of Superwash Merino. So awesome. Very good. Um, so Olive Ira Creation says, what advice would you give a new maker in becoming successful and being a full-time maker? Hmm. I'm going to say, again, patience and determination. As we all know, this craft <laughs> is not a quick one. It is very slow. And even completing one project feels like you ran a marathon and you won it and you took home <laughs> all the medals. At least that's how I feel when I complete something. Even if it's not mm -hmm. the most amazing thing I've ever made, I'm right. like, I won the race, I did it. Yeah. That's how I feel. So just think of that feeling and know that being a full-time maker is that feeling every day. So if you can put in the hustle and put in the work and put in the time, you will get there. It's just a matter of consistency and believing in yourself. That's great advice. That is awesome. I'm definitely on top of that too. Cause it's, cause like the, the beginning of it can feel really, really challenging. And especially I think, um, and what I found a lot, especially with doing these lives is, um, I feel like a lot of us get stuck in this place of, well, I don't know enough to be able to do this thing. Like, I don't know enough to be successful at YouTube, or I don't know enough to become, to put out my first pattern. Um, and there's always more to learn is the thing. Like, there will all, like, even myself, I've been designing now for, what, four years, three, four years, and I'm still constantly learning. I bought another bookshelf for all the books related to crochet and designing that I own. So um, I think we do need to give ourselves a bit of grace as we're on the learning curve. Um, as a maker, if your ultimate goal is to become full-time and to, you know, become a successful designer or maker in any capacity, um, just know that every step is not going to be the right step, but that doesn't mean you stop. You keep going. Just like Ashley said, you have exactly. that perseverance and you just keep your eyes on the prize um, and keep that hustle going. So very good. Awesome. Um, so let's see. Uh, Creative CS Crochet says, I crochet but haven't written a pattern before. How did you guys start writing patterns? I started by just taking notes on whatever I was doing. I started by basically just making something up and a lot of it was wrong. I still am learning the proper way to write patterns. Luckily with blogging anyway, we are very forgiving with oh. each other because there's no a college, there's no degree in crochet design. There's no one way to do things exactly perfect. There are ways that are technically correct, but that doesn't mean that you writing down what you did and helping other people do what you did right. is wrong in any capacity. So for me, I wrote down what I did and a lot of it wasn't technically correct, but that doesn't mean that it's wrong. 
because I'm showing someone how to do something. And my way is just a little bit more, let's say, <laughs> informal. Um, and over time, I've learned more of the technical correct things. But I mean, just last week or a couple of weeks ago, I had a major issue with a pattern and I had to basically recall it and start over and do it right. And I was one stitch off and that's what messed up the whole thing. But, um, it happened. you know, it, even those who do it for a living, it happens and it is what it is. But, you know, getting started designing is really just a matter of making yep. something up and writing it down. That's, that's all that is, that is so, oh gosh, that is so true. Because that's the exact experience I had with my very first pattern. I made something, I didn't even consider it designing. And I think a lot of us are, were in that place at some point, or maybe in that place right now, where you've got, you've written down notes on things that you make because you want to be able to make it again. And maybe you don't see it as designing, you're just making your own notes, but that could be your first design. Um, and that's how my very first design yeah. came up. I wrote down something that I made that was vastly different from anything else that I'd made. And I kept putting it out. And I think the encouragement of the crochet community was like, we want to see this. Um, and like, that's, that's exactly what catapulted mm -hmm. me into designing. And then ultimately it became, well, I just want to keep making stuff. So I just kept making stuff. So that's my two cents on it. Just, just do it. Just get out there and do it. Um, so yeah. Alavira Creations asked, um, Tony, how did you merge working full time? How did you merge from working full time to working for yourself? Uh, it is a very short story. Um, one day I went into work and I was like, I, I was, I realized by the end of the day that I had done more work at work on my own business than on my job. And I am, it's very important for me to be a fair person. And I was like, these people are paying me to work for them and I'm just not working for them. So there's a discrepancy there and I need to rectify it. And I was kind of at an impasse. I was like, either I'm going to go do my own thing or I'm going to dive headfirst into my professional outside the house career. And ultimately I decided this might be the one time that I get to do this, worst case, I can find another HR job. So put in my two weeks and I called it a day. And thankfully it's worked out. But I, I find solace in the fact that if, God forbid, this doesn't end up working out, like my family's not gonna go hungry. Like I'll just go back to work. Like that's, it's not like I threw anything away. Um, and I know that's not the case for everyone. And, you know, you might not be at a place right now where your business can supplement what you would lose from having your full-time job. But if you're keeping track of the income within your business um, and really, you know, being a little bit tighter with the way that your family spends money, you might find yourself in a place where you can do it full-time or at least try it out. Um, so, I don't know. Do your due diligence and make sure you're not like jumping off a cliff with it. But, you know, I, I'm a big proponent of living your dream if you have the opportunity. So, yeah, we'll do that. I will say this. I am exactly the same way. And that's exactly how I felt about college. And it was difficult for my parents especially to stomach the fact that I was going to play with yarn <laughs> instead of go to college. Um, and I'm not saying anyone should not go to college. But for me... I felt a lot more fulfilled. I felt a lot more like I had a purpose and I was headed toward a career that was going to make me happy as well as make me money. And that was the right decision for me. So no one's going to make your business work but you. So there will always be someone else there to give you a job if it doesn't work out. But give it a shot. Give it a shot. That's, the, that's the whole thing. Give it a try. So um, I'm gonna add, I'm gonna throw this question out there. I think we're getting we're getting we're getting into the meat of some things. So Crafty CC says she would love to hear our opinions on the fine line between inspiration and copying. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. it, it is fine a line, fine. and there are legal lines, but there are also just kind of emotional do-gooder lines also. So different people have different opinions on where those lines are. And a lot of people decide within themselves where they will cross and where they won't cross. But um, for me, I try to remain inspired by my own 
life and things that I like. And a lot of the time there are just ways that we can be inspired by ourselves instead of so directly inspired by someone else's creation. Not that you can't appreciate them, you can all day long, but when you go to make something and create something, do what you want to do. Don't just do what someone else is Absolutely. doing. I think, I think when it comes down to it, um, and I've had this conversation with many different crafty people, um, you have to police yourself and you have to be able to look at the situation and answer to yourself. You have to be able to say, you know, where did my inspiration come from? How closely does my idea maybe mimic someone else's? And you're going to know in the pit of your stomach, way deep down in your soul, in your heart, wherever you feel that, you're going to know. Um, if it comes down right. to having to bring legal stuff into it, I mean, that's the nasty bit and that's what you have to do. But I think it all starts with like, you know, within yourself, whether or not you have a truly unique design, um, or if it is far too closely copying someone else. And I think that's where we need to start and just kind of have that, um, that moral compass to say, like, I'm not going to pursue this design idea, because it is it is far too close to someone else's, and just be able to appreciate, you know, their designing and move on to your next project. <laughs> um, yeah, I yes. think that's I think that's really where it comes down to. I'm seeing if we had any other questions. Um, so Twisted String Crochet says, from going, uh, for going from a maker to designing your first pattern, what is your best piece of advice? Mm. Going from being a maker to designing your first pattern. I mean, I feel like I say this all the time, but jump in with both feet and don't think about it so much. If you have a design idea and you are thinking about it, you're probably already got the mm -hmm. design going in there and you're second guessing yeah. yourself. <laughs> Stop doing that. Because you're wasting could've, time. You could have been made, made it. Could have got it done. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. It could be done. Um, so we had a question from, I think it's Shari Heels. She says, have you ever reached a point um, where it stopped being fun and felt more like work? And how do you get out of a funk like that? Yes, I've been there. More than for once. sure. <laughs> um, yeah, and they're weekly mm -hmm. at some point or another. Sometimes it's for a whole day. Sometimes it's for five minutes. But at some point, I always feel like, "Wow, this is work. I'm not having fun right now." And usually, it's somewhere in the midst of doing math for a pattern, because um, I just math is not my thing. Or it's a mean YouTube mm -hmm. comment, or you know, just things that sometimes suck a little, but um, I pull myself out of that by going and playing with Parker for 10 minutes or having a cup of coffee or just picking up my hook because at the end of the day, that's the best part. And it's what drove this whole thing. And when I sit down with yarn, the rest of it, all the work stuff kind of falls away. And I just, I do that thing and I think about the stitches and all of a sudden, I'm not stressed oh, or that's worried. Fantastic. I think that's the. I think that's the, the kernel. That's what you always. You always have to get back to the part of your business that you love. If you're not spending enough time on the thing that got you into it in the first place, then you start to lose your direction. You know, you've got mission creep, as they say. Um, I think it's always important to get back to square one to to get re inspired for all the residual work that you have to do to kind of make your dream a reality. I think that's important. Um, so we had a question from <laughs> bees crocheting. She says, Do you plan your patterns and designing ahead of time? Like, do you um, do you have, have like, like a calendar of like what you're planning to do for like the next while? Or is it just kind of inspiration and make it happen? Um, it used to be inspiration and make it happen. But now I have commitments to companies and I have to schedule things out um, to work alongside other folks. So when it was just me and my little blog and um, I had complete freedom to stop in the middle of something because I had no deadline and go do this other thing because I was inspired by it, um, I would do that quite a bit. But honestly, now, although I have a bit more of a time constraint and I have some deadlines and I have commitments to other people. For me, I'm 
very motivated by deadlines and I'm very motivated by people depending on me. Um, I was always the kid in class that was like, can we please have a test on Friday? Because I wouldn't study otherwise. I needed like accountability. So for me, it works a lot better to have deadlines and to plan things ahead. Um, but I was kind of forced into that, but it's worked out well for me. So yeah, I mean, I have planned through August at this point, which is a little less than I would usually have planned. I would usually plan like a wow. full season. Okay. Ahead. I want to make sure I'm respective of your time because I know we only plan to hang out till eight o'clock. It's like eight oh seven. So can I have you for like another 10 minutes? Is that cool? Okay, I'm, cool. All I'm right. all yours. Um, so just really quick throwing it out there. Um, so Meriwether C, she said math ruins everything. And I completely agree. Math sucks all the fun out of designing yeah. sometimes. But it's so critical. And um, grateful for resources that exist to make the math thing a little bit easier. I know, uh, I think it was Joy of Motion. Um, she put out a um, series of tools related to figuring out some of the math related to crochet and designing. So just throwing that out there as a resource for anyone who has challenges with the mathiness of crochet, especially garments and like grading different sizes. And uh, yeah, yeah, it is what it is. It is exhausting. It's, awesome. it's so tiring. Yeah. Um, I will say one of the saving graces um, for myself not being a mathy person is I got a tech editor earlier this year. And um, being able to just kind of hand my notes over to her and say, hey, do these things um, has been a really huge help. So if you have the resources and the opportunity to engage a tech editor, I think it's a really great investment, but depends on what's best for your business. Um, we had a question from Crochet to Play. She said, any advice on growing your tribe of followers? Oh my goodness. There are so many different philosophies and techniques. And I mean, there are whole books on this subject. There are whole courses, like it gets insane. Um, but for me, I, I haven't studied it. I'm not a social media aficionado, but I've just been myself on the internet and that's literally all I've done. I don't have a secret like hashtag <laughs> formula or a certain like, way of doing this one thing that's like been the magic tool. Um, it takes time. Yep. It takes a very long time. Um, but for me, I think that I've reached a good number of people by being open and honest and just yeah. myself. And I think that that's also what's going to provide longevity for any kind of brand that you're trying to build. Because if you're not being yourself, it's not gonna last very long. You can't walk in somebody exactly. else's that's shoes. That's exactly forever. right. I think another I, I think that's I think ultimately just being yourself and being authentic or whatever jargon you want to use is what most coaches in that space suggest anyway. So it's like, just do your own thing and, and not be so worried about like, am I doing this right? I think, and I think that just translates to so many different parts of being a maker. So whether you're designing or whether you're making finished pieces, whether you're writing books or trying to get better at Instagram or whatever, like remember what it is that's motivating you and, and speak in your own voice, I think is just the most important place to start and always come back to. Um, I think too, one thing to focus on and one thing that I will always suggest and always have is um, understand that social media is like one platform for promoting and like getting out the message about whatever it is that you're trying to do. There are other places and ways to do it. Um, so having a high follower count does not directly correlate to income in your business. It just doesn't. There are a lot of other metrics that are a lot more important to the success of your business. Um, so maybe a follower count isn't like the number one priority. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> Yeah. So um, we got another question that says, how do you deal with haters or mean, hurtful comments? I don't pay them. No, never mind. I, in the beginning, the first dozen or so hateful comments that I got, and there have been nasty ones. I'm not talking like, mm, this isn't my cup of tea. I'm talking like, eat your soul alive. <laughs> kind of nasty comments. Um, they really got to me and they made me second guess what I was doing, how I was doing it. I was like, maybe I don't know enough about this to be trying to have a blog. Maybe I am doing everything wrong. Maybe I 
just shouldn't. Maybe I should just shut this whole thing down right now. But um, I kind of thought back to when you're a kid and there's a bully on the playground and you can either let them break you or you can walk away and go play on the swings with your friends. And I chose to go play on the swings. And now I just, I either delete them or I just go, well, too bad for you. Bad, I like so what sad. I'm doing. I mean, you can't Bye. please everyone and you shouldn't try to. That's not your job in any capacity. Um, and I think too, within this creative space, there's so many more people that are encouraging, um, or even if they're critical, it's constructive. And that's a better place to spend your time. Because getting down in the weeds or God forbid, kind of dropping to that level and dredging up some kind of argument or animosity is just such a waste of your time. There's so many other creative and more yeah. important things that you could be doing. Just like gloss right over that stuff. Just not even worth your time. <laughs> um, we got right. a question from Liz Late Piano. I, I'm sure I said that wrong. She said, um, just kind of paraphrasing, um, how many versions of a pattern do you typically make before you get to the one? Oi. Um, if you're talking about the last pattern I released, the Be Cover Up tunic, I made eight different things before landing on that. I'm talking like made them. Eight of them. That is a so lot much of work, work, you guys. Jeez. But that's been kind of a particularly dramatic <laughs> case. Usually I have two or three iterations of something before I have it the way I want it. But I also... I can, for the most part, with most things, tell if it's going the way I want it to within the first, I don't know, day or two of work on it. And I'm not afraid to frog. I will frog till the <laughs> sun don't shine if I don't like so, it. So question, and, and you don't have to get too specific if you don't want to. So considering that you made so many different versions of this pattern, what about it um, just was not clicking that you had to continue revisiting it? Um, the yarn was tricky to get it to drape right. I knew that I wanted to work with, the yarn was the new Lion Brand Rewind yarn, which is a very unique fiber. It has a very unique texture. And I knew that I wanted to make something that could stand up to the sun and the sand and the abuse it was going to get from being outside in the mm -hmm. summertime in Florida. Um, but I started out not really knowing what I wanted to do. My initial, uh, thing I wanted to make was a dress and my initial you know effort toward that did not go well it looked like I was wearing a child's <laughs> outfit um and so I adjusted and I tried to make it more fitted but with this yarn it just wasn't draping the way I wanted it to which that's fine this yarn really wasn't designed to drape well it wasn't manufactured to be like the perfect garment yarn I yeah. was trying to like yeah. force it into that category um but I was determined to make it work. And so I tried a lot of different shapes. I tried different color combinations. I tried different stitches. Um, and eventually I landed on something that I was happy with, but it's a lovely it a design. Road. I really like um, what you decided to do with the neckline with the shells. I think it's like super pretty. I loved it. Um, so we got a question from Monica, not bland. She says, uh, what let you know what was working in your business or what kind of early milestones um, encourage you to continue moving forward with your business? Um, for me, I was pregnant. The baby was coming and I needed to either get money or get out. <laughs> have so, very specific goals. <laughs> very specific. I needed to help provide for my family. So um, if that wasn't happening by the time my maternity leave a couple months after he was born was happening, then I was going to have to go back to work and either put the blog on the back burner or leave it in the dust completely because yeah. I had a newborn yep. baby. Um, and about a month before he came is when Lion Brand first oh. contacted me to work with them. They were just getting their um, blogger program going. They were kind of like testing the waters somehow. I don't even okay. understand how they found me and my teeny tiny blog. And I was like, hang on. Is this, this, a, real, is this a prank? Real life. <laughs> is, who are you? Send me your picture. So I, and I couldn't believe that. So that was a huge vote of confidence. But again, it was kind of 
dumb luck, honestly. It was right place, right time. They happened to be looking for people to um, promote their yarns. And I think they thought I was a lot more sure. pro yeah. than I was at the time. <laughs> being honest. Um, but, you know, and we've evolved together since then. And the blogger program with Lion Brand has evolved a lot since then. Um, but that was a big vote of confidence for me personally. But also, I just needed to make an income. So right around when the baby came, um, the month he was born, I made $800 that month from ad revenue. Um, and that was huge. I was hoping to make enough to like maybe yeah, buy yeah. some groceries. And I didn't think that was going to happen for years. Um, but it happened five months into blogging. And I just kind of saved everything I could from the blog. And just I was like, I'm going to penny pinch like you've <laughs> never seen before. And I ride this wave as long as I possibly can um, and just stretch every dollar so I can keep doing this next week and the week after. Oh, wow. That's that's quite the journey, though, like to to consider even as early yeah. as you were in your business to have caught the eye of such a large company within our um, industry. And I'm assuming ke you've kept up that relationship since the beginning. Like, that's really that's really amazing. What's that relationship been like working with Lion Brand and kind of evolving in your business um, as part of that partnership? Um, well, Lion Brand is a very, very old company. They're the oldest yarn uh, brand in America, I think. Um, so they definitely were looking to spice things up and get into this whole new blogger, like online influencer thing. And they didn't really know from what I've gathered where to start. So they just started kind of casting the net and looking for anyone that was interested. Um, and I was like, I, that's like the dream <laughs> working with Lion. I submitted my first design and I was like, is this really real? <laughs> Am I just sending this to right. someone? <laughs> what? What's going on? Um, and ever since then, I mean, I've gotten my act together and learned a lot since then. And I've become a much uh, more proficient designer, I think. Hopefully that's the truth. Um, and I think that their program has evolved a lot and they're definitely much more targeted with what they're looking for. And they've um, really honed in on what they want the blogger program to do. Uh, and I've just kind of ridden the wave along with them. But it's been a wonderful partnership. They are some of the nicest people um, I've ever met. They also are very honest with me, which I really need. I benefit from constructive criticism. Um, and I've been able to come to them and just be like, hey, yeah, I need help with this. And I don't know what so help me. And they are just, they're wonderful. I couldn't ask for a better work relationship. I also think that it's easy to assume that influencers or bloggers, um, when they're working with a company, they're just spewing out whatever the company mm. wants them to say. At least I on the internet all the time. I'm like, I know you don't eat those Oreos. You don't look <laughs> like you eat Oreos ever. Yeah. But talking about how amazing Oreos are. But for me, Lion Brand has never once asked me to say anything that didn't come from my own head. Or, you know, like, it's just been a very, they want my honest opinion out there in the marketplace. And they want me to stay true to what I think. And that is so important. I just love what Lion Brand, do, Lion Brand is doing right now. Like, they're, they're very clear and targeted on who they're who they're appealing to these days. I think there's a new wave within the maker community of of youth and and freshness and creativity and kind of pushing some boundaries of what maybe we thought that knitting and crochet could do before and i feel like lion brand is really on the on the front edge of you know all the possibilities with all the amazing yarns that they've been coming out with and um different collaborators that they've been working with it's kind of giving us another side of them as a company i think um so it sounds like a really really great relationship yeah. which is awesome um, so again, I'm not going to hold you up for too much longer. I, I promise. Um, just, I'm going to take two more questions and I have a question for you and then we're going to wrap this up. Um, so we have a question from Sarah okay. in 1990. She said, how do you balance your mom life and your maker life? Some days I do. And some days <laughs> I don't. Some days I try to juggle everything and everything gets dropped. And that is what I usually don't put on the internet. <laughs> so remember that what you see is not always the whole truth. It's not 100% of what goes on 
in our work. Um, but as far as balancing things, I do have a ton of help from my husband. He also works from home. So we kind of split the baby duties um, right about down the middle. So I'm not solo in that aspect by any means. And that's huge. But um, I think that a lot of it for me for a long time, I was very worried about having a business at all that I was neglecting my role as a mom. But I decided that in order to remain a mom that was at home all the time with him, I had to keep that business running. And that required time and attention away from him. And that's okay. So I've had to learn to be a lot more gentle with myself and what I expect mm -hmm. of myself. Um, but really, it's just a matter of deciding what you think you can realistically get done in the time that you have. And sometimes that's one hour after the kids go to bed a day and that's all and if that's all you have use it and you know to the best of your ability but if you can carve out more time try to do that for yourself and for the business that you want to have that's really really i'll have to hold on to that one for when the not cat babies come around <laughs> like be gentle with ourselves <laughs> we are we are all still figuring this stuff out a day at a time um we had a question from chantelle of knititude she says i'm debating on adding ads to my blog um but i just don't know if i have enough traffic um for it to be worth it would you suggest just doing it anyway and going from there or is there any other kind of strategy to adding ads to your blog I say, why the heck not? You are working so hard at your designs, Chantel, you specifically. I know you are because your designs are on point. Um, and if you're working that hard at it, for me, it's another line of passive income. It's another stream of um, something that you can spend a couple of afternoons putting together and see where it goes. It may not earn a ton of money right off the bat, but it's going to earn something. So to me, that would be worth giving it a shot. Um, I put ads on my blog a couple of months after I started it. And then eventually as my traffic grew, I was able to move to an ad network, um, a couple of different ad networks over time. And that has proven to be very lucrative for me and my business model. Um, and it's not gonna be right for everybody, but if you're interested in it and you wanna give it a shot, it doesn't take all that long to set up. So I say try it. And if it doesn't work, you can always take it um, later. So on that same vein, I know because I spend a lot of time on your blog that you actually have a series about starting a blog yourself. Um, would you mind sharing a bit of information about yeah. that and where people can find that series? Yes. So if you go to Sorella.com, there are a couple of tabs at the top. And one of them says start a blog. And that will just lead you to a static page that has all the instructions to start your own blog for fairly inexpensive, um, and it has just a lot of screenshots and instructions. <laughs> Ooh, can't talk. I've been talking a lot. Um, a lot of instructions for getting started. And then there's another tab called Blogging Tips that has several different blog posts I've written on things like adding advertising to your blog, how to make money with a blog, how to create content for your blog, how to utilize different social media platforms to get your content seen and all of that kind of stuff. And I really started all of that because I was getting, as my blog grew, I was getting a lot of questions like what we've gotten tonight about starting a business, getting it going, how to share it, all of these things that I address in the blog post. And I found that I was answering a lot of emails with basically the yeah. same information. Yeah. So I was like, I'm just going to make this public. Anyone who wants to use it can. And um, I've gotten a lot of feedback since I posted all of that stuff about a year and a half ago um, that it's really helped a lot of people. And I'm very, very glad that I put it together. So it's all there free for you to use. It's not like a course you have to buy or any of that kind of stuff. I also post all of my income reports on my blog and that dates back to about a year and a half ago as well. Um, and I post how much money I make, where the different income streams come from. And I write out, just month by month a little bit about how the month went and how the income went and all of that kind of stuff and for me i wanted to do that and put that together because i wasn't seeing any resources like that at least not in our field and i gained a lot of knowledge and insight from people in other blogging niches um who would post their income reports and would post blogging guides and things like that so i decided to 
go ahead and just tell everybody everything and hope that it would help someone at some point. And the feedback I've gotten is that it's been at least mildly helpful for a couple of people. So for that, I'm Well, I'm, I'm happy. sure I speak for a lot of people who are watching this and a lot of people who aren't, that those income reports are insanely motivating um, for anyone who is doing this kind of work. So speaking of, and I'm going to take the last question, then I'm going to have you, I'm going to have you kind of chat a little bit about, you know, where people can find you and make sure we have all your links. Um, but my last question, something I am dying to know, I know that you put out um, all of your pattern, all, all slash most of your patterns, of course, not happy yarn mail for free and with video tutorials and everything's available on your blog. But you also have um, your patterns, your printable patterns available on Etsy. And forgive me for being all of being in business, but your Etsy numbers are amazing. And I, I feel like I need to know even just a kernel of the, the genius behind um, how you market Etsy and all like specifically how um, how you kind of translate that type of income from Etsy considering that your patterns are available for free on your blog. So I think there are a couple of different answers to the question. Um, for one, I don't know what numbers are amazing or what numbers are really embarrassing because they're really low because no one else publishes. So I don't know what you make on Etsy, I don't know anybody else makes on Etsy. So I just, hearing that is extremely motivating. And thank you, thank you for all of the encouragement. Um, I'm definitely proud of my Etsy sales, but at the same time, I have no frame <laughs> of reference at all. So that's great to hear. I'm so glad that You're I'm crushing so it. Well. You really are. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, I think that a big part of it is that all of my blogs, all of my, oh God. We're almost done. We're all <laughs> I just have so many thoughts. Um, I think part of it is that all of my designs are on my blog for free, which sounds kind of counterintuitive because why would someone pay for something that's free? But I think that it's because all of the content is there for free for them, the readers, the buyers, whoever, to kind of either give it a test drive or look over the pattern. When you're looking at just a paid pattern listing on Etsy and there's no frame of reference outside of that description, at least for me as a consumer, I'm kind of sure. iffy on it. I'm kind of like, am I going to be able to follow this? Is this outside my wheelhouse? Is this, how complex is this? Is this like a 35 page pattern or is this like a two page mm -hmm. pattern? I'm just, there's a lot of questions sure. in my mind. And it doesn't keep me from buying that $5 pattern or $3 or however much. Um, but if I could see a bit of a preview of a pattern on a blog and not necessarily follow it from that blog post because the ads are annoying and there's, you know, just all kinds of internet complications and whatnot, um, I would be a lot more likely to buy a pattern for a few dollars if I could kind of give sure. it a once over on someone's blog first. And that's some of the feedback that I've gotten is that they don't necessarily buy the pattern because they don't want to use my blog. That they found it on Etsy and they don't even know it, that it's available for free. I would say a good 80% of the buyers on Etsy have seen the blog post for that pattern and know it's there for free, but they're choosing to pay the couple bucks so they can get the nice printable version and all of those other nice things about buying the or the okay. PDF version. No. Well, I'll probably, I'm sure I'll have some follow-up questions for you, but I want to go ahead and wrap this up. I want to, um, again, give you an opportunity to tell us where to find you. Tell us about all the arms of your business. Give us all the good links and all that stuff about Sorella. Okay, well, Sorella.com is where you'll find all of my free um, patterns and tutorials and all of that. It will also lead you to all of my different social medias. There's links on Sorella.com to all the different places you can follow me or you can go to Pinterest, Instagram, Facebook, any of those places and just search Sorella and I'll come right up. Um, so that's nice and easy. I also have Happy Yarn Mail, which is a subscription kit club service that runs every month. The signups actually are just coming up. It always goes up for sale on the first of the month at midnight and then it goes until it sells out. And we usually sell, up, sell out around the first week of the month because I can only do so many uh, orders every month. It's just me and my husband, so <laughs> you get too crazy. It only takes so many. Um, but that is basically just a, uh, an exclusive pattern, everything you need to make the pattern, and it's just kind of nice, easy, fun, um, doable, small scale. You're not gonna get like a kit for a crazy, intricate Afghan in there. It's gonna be something fun and quick. 
Um, and that's at happyyarnmail.com. And then I also have started hand dyeing my own yarn um, to go along with all of my designs. And that is called Handmade Home Fibers, which you can find here on Instagram or at handmadehomefibers.com. Awesome. Oh my gosh, I love it. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with me, Ashley, and working with me through those technical difficulties. Um, I hope we'll get a chance to do this again super duper soon. Um, for anyone who we weren't able to get to your question, I'm so sorry. Um, but, you know, we definitely want to, um, you know, thank Ashley for hanging out with us. And these lives are every single Tuesday. So next month, we're going to have a brand new topic. And fingers crossed, at the end of the month, we'll do this again um, with another lovely maker within the community. So thank you, everyone, so much for hanging out with us. Thank you again, Ashley. I appreciate you so much. And um, everybody have a good night. See you later. <laughs> thank you so much. Bye, girlfriend. I'll, I'll talk see to you guys. You soon. Bye. <laughs>